Good afternoon and welcome to the last program of the year for the GK Chesterton Institute, which is a very special one. Thank you for joining us today. It, this is our last event and it, there's no better way to bring this year's program to an, to an end than by presenting the premiere screening of Chesterton Institute production, a Chestertonian conversation with Father Ian Boyd, for which we have the privilege of having Father Boyd present with us through the uh, marvels of technology from Canada. This video presentation is from a 2013 interview with Father Boyd, which took place in his office at Seton Hall University a short time before the 40th anniversary of the Institute and the Chesterton Review. It is with the collaboration of Seton Hall University's Technology and Learning Department, more importantly, uh, the cooperation and the excellent work of Michael Pisciotta from the department that who has edited this video, that we were able to produce this documentary you're about to see. In it, Father Boyd speaks of various topics about Chesterton and the work of the Institute. Father Boyd is an internationally recognized Chesterton scholar and author, author of the novels of G.K. Chesterton published in London in 1975. For many years, he was professor of English at St. Thomas More College in the University of Saskatchewan, and from 1999 to 2020, he was a member of the Department of English at Seton Hall University in South Orange. He has written and lectured about Chesterton and Chestertonian themes all over the world, and he has played a key role in the Chesterton revival worldwide. It is with Father Boyd's guidance and inspiration that we are now preparing to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Institute and the Chesterton Review. This great accomplishment is a testament to Father Boyd's lifelong work dedicated to the work and thought of G.K. Chesterton in Canada, in the United States and all over the world. I would like to welcome Father Boyd and thank him for joining us today from Canada and we also welcome Dr. Dermot Quinn. <laughs> It is with great pleasure that we now invite you to view a Chestertonian conversation with Father Boyd, which will be followed by a conversation with Father Boyd, Dr. Quinn and myself. And I will invite you to post your comments or questions in the chat function. Please enjoy the, the presentation and we will see you in 27 minutes after the documentary is finished. Thank you. there uh, was to illustrate Dermot's talk, okay. this Chestertonian idea about of, of, of the society in which you have movement but without ever arriving at a destination. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it recalled a wonderful comment, one of my favorite comments from Chesterton, which he, which he uh, expressed in a little verse. Uh, he gave a child for a birthday present, a little boy, a picture book. Well, the boy couldn't read. He was too young to read. Mm -hmm. So Chesterton, in his verse, said, uh, consoled the little boy by saying, uh, "You won't, you can't read these verses this, that I'm writing." But he said, "Don't, never mind. Uh, you can see, and all directness is divine." And then he said, mm. at the end of it, his advice to the little boy was, "Mind your books, my little man, and listen to the pedants." screeds, all the things they write, and strictures. But, Chesterton said, don't believe in anything that can't be told in colored pictures. <laughs> so in other words, trust your imagination. The, 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 the childlike view that Chesterton taught to see 
for the first time uh, the world. Chesterton has said, you know, we're still in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. The trouble is our eyesight has been damaged and we can't see the glories of the ordinary, as mm -hmm. you say, yes. the, the, mm -hmm. the transfiguration, the transfiguration mm -hmm. of the commonplace, the Flannery O'Connor mm -hmm. uh, uh, theme, yeah. which, is, which is so Chestertonian that uh, the, the, the presence of God in a world from which he seems to be absent. Uh, and the joy that comes, Cheston has said at the end of Orthodoxy, his famous line, the joy was the gigantic secret of the Christian. Uh, but he sometimes thought that when our Lord went up to the hills to pray, uh, Cheston has said, he went up to the hills to laugh. Uh, he who sits above the heavens laughs. So the laughter, the joy of Christ, uh, was uh, something that Cheston found even in the crucifixion. Uh, uh, Cheston's poem was, dead is the king who never was born, people said. You know, mm -hmm. the God who created the world dies on the cross. And Cheston said, no, the trumpet of truth from the cross replies, dead is the king who never will die. Uh, mm -hmm. His his uh, something very biblical mm -hmm. about Chesterton. He was steeped uh, in in in, in a, he was a biblical Christian. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that non-Catholic Protestant Christians love Chesterton is uh, he 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 was a man of the Bible. I was going to say that there's a prophetic element in Chesterton, uh, and. I realize prophets address their message, first of all, to their contemporaries. But the other sense of prophecy is that Chesterton, when he began mm -hmm. writing in 1900, uh, wrote fantasy as well as essays. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, these, these fantasies, these, these novels and short stories, uh, must have seemed fantastic to his readers. I mean, he predicted, for example, uh, that uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, that they, that that century would see wars such as the world had never seen. Well, that was a period of Edwardian peace. This must have seemed a preposterous prediction. Well, we have lived to see Chesterton's prophecies fulfilled. So, in a sense, we are his real audience, um, because we can understand better uh, the truth of what he said. I remember he wrote again uh, something in a, in a very stable society where he said that the next great heresy was going to be an attack on morality and especially on sexual morality. Well, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we hardly need to say how, how, true that, how, how true that prophecy was. So he was like a human seismograph. He sensed uh, the tremors uh, uh, in, in, in an apparently stable society, which would indicate uh, a, a, a kind of uh, social revolution uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in thinking. He also predicted, he also claimed, uh, which again would have surprised his writers when people were frightened, rightly so, of mm -hmm. communism and the threat from Russia and so on. And Chester had said, no, no. The madness of tomorrow is not in Moscow, it is in Manhattan, uh, because uh, it is in from the consumerist culture mm. has a greater power to undermine traditional morality than totalitarian systems uh, such as the, the communists and, 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 and the Nazis even. So he, he was, uh, he had what the Bible calls a gift of wisdom, um, that the biblical sense of wisdom. It wasn't information, T.S. Eliot says, it wasn't even knowledge. It was something better than that. It was a gift of wisdom. Uh, there was a, 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 a French member of the French Academy mm -hmm. uh, and a great historian of medieval philosophy, Etienne Gilson, uh, who, who taught at the University of Toronto at St. Michael's College for years. And he said uh, that every bit and parcel of Chesterton's writing had to be preserved. 
uh, even his little sayings, because he said with Chesterton, uh, he was someone who possessed the truth rather than someone who had to argue his way to the truth. So he said when he met Chesterton in Toronto during one of Chesterton's visits to America, by the way, there were two of them, one about 1920 and again 10 years later uh, when he came to Notre Dame and also toured the country. Uh, Gielsen met him <laughs> and he said uh, that uh, everything he said was a kind of intellectual revelation. Uh, he always threw a new light on familiar subjects. Chesterton believed that the, the real danger was that we did not see what was right under our noses, so to speak, that you had to look at something 99 times and then the hundredth time you would see it for the first time. So I think Chesterton's tactic as a writer was to awaken the imagination to see the familiar for the first time. Wonderful title, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, uh, published in 1904, describes the world, he said, 80 years later, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 1984, right. uh, a futuristic novel. And it has, how can you not love a novel which begins, the first sentence begins with this, the human race to which so many of my readers belong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, you, go on, you, go on, you go on from there. Uh, uh, and, you know, that book was read, I, I find the readers of Chesterton are interesting too. That book was read, read in prison by Hitler's architect, Speer, um, who read this novel and he said in his own journal, Speer wrote afterwards, he said, when I read this book, I thought, my God, he's described, mm. he's described the, what was happened with the Nazis. How could he know back in 1904? Mm. Uh, so Speer found in this fantasy um, a description of what he, the sad experience, mm -hmm. uh, which mm. Speer, I'm sorry to say, was involved in himself, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the Nazi tyranny all fantasy, but Chesterton believed that the imagination was an organ of perception, hmm. that the deepest truths could be told through stories, through parables, and that, uh, yes, Chesterton was a great, one of, as, as Gilson said, one of the deepest thinkers who ever lived, but uh, he was, I think his deepest insights were told through, uh, through, through his, through his he was a poet through his poetry, through his novels, through his short stories. Uh, there you found the imagination of Chesterton, uh, in which, as he said, uh, you know, the, the logician, the thinker tried to get the universe in his head, but the poet simply floated on the ocean uh, and, and ex accepted the world. And I think that Chesterton, uh, the imagination of Chesterton, <coughs> is immensely appealing. He was impressed by ordinary Americans um, the, and, and the democratic spirit of the country, that uh, the taxi driver, uh, Chesterton, and his, Chesterton and his wife said that in Notre Dame they preferred to live with an ordinary American family. And uh, they, they were very much at home uh, with with ordinary Americans, uh, he 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 loved he loved the country. He wrote a book, "What I Saw in America," and then a second book of essays about side locks, side side, -lights. side lights on uh, what is it, New England and Greater? No, I I got the title New wrong. New England and Greater New York. And the Greater New York, yes. He said in New York how he admired even the uh, broad Broadway and the lights. Uh, and the advertisements, he said, it would be wonderful if you were someone who couldn't read. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, he, dis, he, he distrusted, he distrusted American, uh, I won't say capitalism, but he distrusted gigantism, uh, huge corporations, huge governments. Uh, he believed that the future of the world depended on small communities, a 
above all the family, that if something happened to the family, if it disintegrated, everything was lost. Uh, and he thought America was a nation of strong families. Uh, he, he, he rather loved the country. Uh, and uh, I think his, his insights into uh, life, the life of our nation, of America and the Western world uh, uh, are, are still relevant today. I think also of a visit he made to Canada at the same time. Mm -hmm. He gave a talk, uh, actually in London, to a Canadian literary society. Uh, and he talked about, uh, the question he asked was whether Canada as a kind of new nation, starting as a colony, uh, whether it could ever have a literature of its own. And Chester Sen said he didn't know, but he, but he believed this, that in order to have a literature, every nation needed two things. Uh, first of all, he said they needed a landscape, uh, that is, a countryside that they loved. And secondly, he said they needed a legend. Uh, so he said the Americans had this. Their legend was the Mayflower, uh, the story of the Pilgrim Fathers, which Chester said was largely a myth. Uh, uh, you know, Chesterton, uh, Chesterton made some, some uh, unsympathetic comments about the Puritan Pilgrim Fathers. He told the Americans that he rather admired the fact that they had a Thanksgiving. Uh, the British didn't have such a, a holiday. <coughs> he said, you celebrate it. You celebrate the arrival of the Pilgrim Fathers. He said, we should have a Thanksgiving to celebrate their departure. Uh, <laughs> So uh, he was, his humor uh, is a, a great feature of Chesterton. Did he in that day, you know, in the early 1900s, did he deal with issues like racism, which we, we're faced with constantly now? And... He thought, uh, he thought he despised uh, racism, the, the Nazi variety of any kind. Um, first of all, he thought it was intellectually fifth rate. He thought these were, were ideas which had been discredited a hundred years earlier. And to see them being taken seriously again um, seemed preposterous. He meant that everywhere he went in America, um, he found a people who still prayed. Um, Chesterton, Chesterton, uh, as, as I was thinking, Paul Johnson, uh, in his book about America, made the same comment that Johnson said that when he, even when he visited the homes of wealthy Americans in Texas, he was very impressed that Americans, uh, rich and poor, prayed before a meal, said grace before a meal. And he said in European, in a typical, uh, at a European dinner party, this was rather unusual, but not in America. Coming to America, he said, I'm a journalist, but he said, I, mm -hmm. in America, a journalist means someone else, <laughs> a press man. Right. Uh, and he said, Chester said, really, I cannot boast that I have uh, broken into someone's bedroom when the door was shut in my face, you know, mm -hmm. to get an interview. I wasn't mm -hmm. that kind of journalist. Yeah. Uh, he said, I haven't, I haven't had done any of these things which are the boast of modern journalists. So he was, he was very, again, witty, right. uh, laughing, uh, enjoying himself and enjoying the company when he arrived. Looking at the world today, I think, I think it's the world that Chesterton described when he began writing uh, in 1900. Uh, I, th I, think, I think Chesterton, uh, understood the, 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 the coming world. I must say, I don't think you talk about people who are being Eurocentric or Western centric. I think you could say uh, that Chesterton did not have any special insights about the world of the Far East, uh, about China or Japan. I remember some years ago, uh, I was giving lectures in Japan and I was interested in um, Japanese Christian writers. And of course, of the interest 
the Japanese had, strangely enough, in Chesterton. I even wondered how you could translate him into Japanese. Uh, so I devoted the special issue of our journal to Chesterton and Japan. Well, uh, I think we found interesting things to say, but I had to suppress certain things Chesterton had said about Japan. Uh, it turned out he didn't much like uh, the coming of Japanese uh, Japan as, as a world power. Although even there he made, although he didn't understand Japan, he had a rather shrewd comment. Uh, he said that his fear of Japan was that they had borrowed the technology of the West without understanding the spiritual dimension of Western culture. And he thought to separate technology from the spiritual basis of a culture uh, represented something extremely dangerous, both for the West and for the East. I immediately think of someone who's forgotten a bit now, but was in the 1960s, a great pop figure, Marshall McLuhan, um, who, uh, who wrote about uh, the importance, the way in which technology has changed our way of looking at society. The media is the message and so on. Well, Marshall McLuhan uh, was, as it were, a disciple of Chesterton. Uh, he, his first essay was an essay about Chesterton and McLuhan was on, uh, helped us with our Chesterton work. He was on our editorial board. Uh, he spoke at uh, Chesterton, uh, uh, Chesterton conferences and so on. Uh, so, Chesterton said that he admired uh, technology, uh, the ability for what you said to be broadcast around the world, but he was concerned that you didn't, that what was being broadcast wasn't worth listening to. Um, that is, uh, he, he did think, he did, he did think we needed, uh, well, leisure was the basis of culture. As, as has been famously said, Chesterton said that we needed a, a little more time for reflection. He said activity, activity, uh, activity should be a preparation for contemplation. And when he came to America, his criticism of America was that the Americans worked too hard, that they worked and worked, but they didn't rest enough. Uh, he praised America, however, uh, that he thought, unlike his own country, uh, he thought America was a deeply religious place. He said, America is a nation with the soul of a church. Uh, and that was a phrase picked up by President George W. Bush when he visited China. And he was trying to explain to the Chinese that they would not understand America unless they understood uh, the religious dimension of American life. I think uh, in, a, in a work such as the one we've been carrying on for 40 years with the Chesterton Institute, that its effect is what I would call cumulative. Uh, it, it builds up slowly, but it builds on the past. Uh, and in that way, I think it's Catholic. I think uh, for us Catholics, uh, we do think in terms of the future. We are people who are Easter people, people of hope, turning towards the future. So this is not an antiquarian uh, cult of Chesterton. Uh, it's, we're talking about something which is immensely relevant for today and tomorrow and for the future. So my vision for the Institute has, has to do with making people aware of what is already present, what has been, has been going on for 40 years, and we hope will continue for another, for a hundred years into the future, uh, that, that a Catholic university is not just for uh, today, for uh, uh, the moment, it's for it's for it's for all time, and I think I think Chesterton is being rediscovered, 
uh, everywhere. And uh, we are, I think we can say that without boasting, we are at the center of that work. And it would be, I think, of great interest to many people uh, to, to know uh, that, as I say, the, the secret of Seton Hall, partly, is the presence of the Chesterton Institute right here in our own university. I think, I think uh, the, our alumni, I think the Catholic world, first of all, but, but also a much, even a lar an even larger world of those who read and those who love Chesterton, and that goes beyond all. Uh, that's, that's, that's an ecumenical dimension. And uh, I, th I think we represent that too. And also remember, I would stress the fact that we're now publishing the review in five languages. I think that's a metaphor mm -hmm. for uh, the world. And remember that those five languages, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, uh, the, 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 that those are written, those come out of conferences held in those countries, whether it's Brazil or Italy mm -hmm. or France or Spain, or Lithuania or Poland. Uh, and therefore, these things are written by, as Chesterton would approve, by local Chestertonians. Uh, so Chesterton is, uh, our, our, Chesterton, our Chesterton work is as... Professor Quinn says, it's versatile, it deals with themes, particular themes, whether it is the green movement or the pro-life movement, uh, the return of eugenics and the dangers that represent, humor, the role of humor and imagination, the importance of imagination in both politics and in, uh, you know, for looking at social social problems, uh, you find Chesterton has been there before us. And uh, we, we, would like, we would like to alert people to the presence of the, uh, the, the, that Chesterton work right here at the university. So we need to do something to startle people to an awareness that at Seton Hall, the leading Christian writer for our age uh, finds his home. That he's been here, but his presence hasn't been well known, uh, as well known as it should be, uh, for the, the people in the New Jersey, New York, America itself. Uh, and, and, and that is what we, we have to find a way of uh, startling people, surprising them.
we hope that you have enjoyed uh, this presentation. And I would like to leave you now with uh, Dr. Derma Quinn, who will have a little conversation with Father Boyd. And again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to post them in the chat. So. OK, well, um, uh, thank you, Gloria, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm uh, not in my usual place. Uh, we had a few little technical difficulties, uh, and that's why I'm sitting cheek by jowl with, with the executive producer of this marvelous film. I congratulate Gloria uh, on, on, on uh, this beautiful documentary, actually, uh, devoted to Father Boyd and, and his work here at Seton Hall. Uh, so I expect uh, Oscar nominations fairly shortly. It's, it's really been a, a, a lovely little um, documentary. So uh, it's it's tremendous to welcome Father Boyd back to Seton Hall, albeit through the miracle of Microsoft Teams, but uh, he is as much part of our community and our family as he has ever been. Uh, so it's 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 great to see him uh, back among us, as it were. Uh, and um, yeah, I have just a few little thoughts, Father, uh, that I kind of um, might put to you just by way of getting our conversation going. And I mean, it seems to me that you use a marvelous phrase to describe Chesterton as a kind of human seismograph, uh, you know, someone who is enormously sensitive uh, to the cultural undercurrents of, of his time. Uh, and of course, uh, the central work of our institute uh, is that um, he is prophetic so to speak, of our own time, so that uh, that human seismography, that sensitivity to cultural undercurrents, uh, which Chesterton manifested 100 years ago or 70 years ago, uh, is every bit as important, uh, uh, every bit as important today. So that being that being the case, um, it seems to me, Father, that essentially you've made this argument uh, in your conversation a few uh, a few years ago when this uh, film was recorded, uh, that we can see Chesterton in two distinctive uh, um, uh, characteristics. First of all, as a critic, and secondly, as a celebrant. Uh, he is a critic and an extremely acute critic of the um, uh, intellectual collapse, as he saw it, uh, of Edwardian uh, society. Uh, you know, uh, certain things that he found uh, intellectually problematic, you know, various cults, the cult of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of progress, the cult of science, the cult of, uh, of, 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 of consumerism. Uh, so he is an extremely acute critic. Uh, and I think those criticisms of uh, the Edwardian and Georgian world are, as you said, uh, even more appropriate uh, for or as appropriate uh, today as they were then. And then the other uh, aspect of Chesterton, which you uh, talk about, is Chesterton as, as a celebrant. I mean, as a celebrant of what we might call the romance of ordinary life, uh, the beauty of ordinary life, uh, the beauty, uh, obviously, of the of the sacred. Uh, and uh, you you said you quoted him to great effect that uh, we are still in Eden. Our eyes are damaged, but uh, we are still in Eden. So would you agree, Father, that um, essentially the work that you have done so brilliantly over the course of your life uh, and the work that we're trying to do in the Chester Institute uh, is a work of, in a sense, cultural criticism on the one hand and uh, sacramental celebration on the other. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that how you would, uh, how, 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 how you might characterize what we're, what we're doing? Well, in that case, I, I, will, I will talk a little and um, let's see if that uh, doesn't fill, fill some gaps. I mean, I think, you know, I, you? Uh, I faded a little. OK, uh, well, um, can, can you hear me now? Um, yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. Well, um, you know, here's the other thing that I would I would say, Father, just picking up on a few little ideas that you threw out for us. Um, I absolutely agree with you uh, when you quote Gilson uh, to the effect that uh, Chesterton, so to speak, possessed the truth. He didn't have to argue towards it, but that he possessed it as a kind of intuitive um, insight. Uh, and I mean, that's the sense that you get over and over again when you read uh, Chesterton, that um, I'm often reminded of a 
remark or a little sentence in a novel by the American novelist William Maxwell, and he's describing a couple going into Chartres Cathedral. Uh, and um, the, the, the phrase that he uses is, uh, they felt as if they'd entered into some great act of understanding. And I think with Chesterton, when you read Chesterton, uh, you feel as if you've entered into some great act of understanding so that uh, you are in the company of someone who, as you say, is in possession of the truth, uh, that it has come to him as uh, almost like a kind of uh, intuitive, insight that that doesn't have to be argued uh, for. And that's that I think that's one of the kind of uh, exhilarating aspects of reading Chesterton, that you're in the company uh, of a deeply wise person. Uh, so I think I think Gilles Saint, I think Gilles Saint was quite right there. Uh, the other um, uh, you know, thing that you know, your your remarks brought to my mind uh, uh, where I mean, the other thing is this: you know, Chesterton's relationship with with America, uh, and his and his love of America, and as you say, his love of ordinary Americans. Um, and I think that that is something that we should sort of bear in mind. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm thinking of that because I've been reading recently or rereading um, Tocqueville, uh, you know, Democracy in America, uh, and um, you know. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe you can correct me. Uh, you can you can tell me, but I'm not sure whether uh, Chesterton had read Democracy in America. But I, 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 if he had, um, I, I, I suspect that he approved of it uh, because um, you know what Tocqueville argues in Democracy in America are basically two things: that uh, what you see in America is equality, uh, and uh, what he calls equality of conditions. Uh, and that is the overwhelming fact of American life, equality. And, and Chesterton, of course, would approve of equality. Ch Chesterton is a, a kind of a wonderfully egalitarian thinker. Uh, so the first thing that uh, Tocqueville uh, notices about America uh, is its uh, equality. And then the second thing that he notices, and then again, and, and I think this is Chestertonian as well. The second thing that he notices is um, uh, the importance of associations, uh, civic associations in, in America, so that Americans are forever joining things. Uh, they believe in 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 local organizations and in and in local communities. So uh, as, as you describe uh, Chesterton's love of ordinary Americans, um, uh, praying, devout, uh, grateful people. Uh, I think that um, you know what you what you really um, uh, what you really see here uh, in uh, in 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 uh, in Tocqueville is a kind of um, analog to that in in Chesterton. His wonderful phrase was that he discovered in America a nation with the soul of a church, and that phrase. Uh, President Bush repeated during his visit to China when he, when uh, the president explained to the to the uh, non-believing uh, <laughs> Chinese authorities that in dealing with America they would be dealing with a religious people. But the one, the other thing, uh, I think we should emphasize about Chesterton is the a quality that Franz Kafka noticed uh, in his writing. Kafka knew nothing about Chesterton's uh, personal background, but uh, he read him in faraway Prague, and Kafka said, <laughs> I don't know who he is, but <laughs> Kafka said that he has found God, and the joy of life, uh, which you mentioned, Dermot, uh, the celebration of the ordinary, uh, is a great quality in Chesterton. Uh, I love, as a, as a priest, uh, a comment he made, or one of his characters makes in a novel 
uh, appropriately entitled Man Alive. Uh, and one of the characters there, I'm sure, speaks for Chesterton when he says, uh, in the Middle Ages, when people generally uh, were a people of faith, of Christian faith, um, they were happy people. And they needed priests then to remind them, uh, well, about the last thing. They were so happy that Jesus uh, drove it occasionally into uh, reminding, to be reminded of things like death and judgment, heaven and hell. But then Chesterton said, in our age, Chesterton said, he found people so gloomy that he thought we needed for our age a new kind of priest. A priest who would remind them that they were not dead yet. Uh, <laughs> That's wonderful. Chesterton, uh, right to the end of his life, uh, celebrated the joy. So you can be funny and serious at the same time. Uh, those two things go together. So Chesterton's jokes are never incidental. They're very deep things. Uh, he teaches us the joy of life and he celebrates the joy of thinking. Uh, that is why H.N. Uh, Gielsen, uh, the, the great French medievalist, a member of the French Academy, uh, met Chesterton uh, in the 1930s in Toronto, where Chesterton happened to be giving some lectures. And uh, in Chesterton, in Toronto, Chesterton was a guest of my own community, the Brazilian Fathers. So, at the dinner table of the Brazilians, uh, Chesterton and Gilson uh, sat next to each other and talked. And Gilson said, uh, Gilson remarked afterwards uh, that uh, that he how he wished someone recorded what Chesterton had to say. He said, everything Chesterton said, everything Chesterton said uh, was uh, an intellectual revelation. Uh, he said, the small talk was not small. And, and he said he, he, he would he would remember it to the end of his life, um, what Chesterton taught him. And this, as I say, was in uh, the, the, a conversation held at, at, a, at a dinner table. Uh, he, uh, it's nice to think of, of, of Chesterton um, as a conversationalist. The other thing is, Chesterton never dominated conversations. He was more interested in hearing what other people had to say than in expressing his own views. He had a great respect, almost reverence, for, uh, for ordinary people. I like the story they tell, uh, Maisie Ward, his biographer tells, of uh, a, 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 a family, uh, a mother and her little boy uh, visiting Chesterton's home. And uh, Chesterton and the little boy went out to the garden. And so when they came back in, the mother said to the little boy, well, what did he teach you? And the little boy said, he caught, he taught me how to catch balloons with my mouth. <laughs> That's a wonderful story, <laughs> Father. I That's thought that, that, yeah. that, 
that is uh, that that is the, the Chester that we love. Absolutely. Uh, he has, with uh, uh, with uh, his uh, uh, with he he loved. Sadly, his wife. Uh, they were unable to have children, but 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 they but they loved children, and uh, that love of uh, that love of uh, holy innocence that comes with childhood is something that uh, you find in a lot of Chesterton's writings. Well, Father Boyd, this is the best way to end today's. Um, conversation and uh, it's always great to see you and and the fact that you have shared some wonderful you know um, knowledge and and stories and we have um, it has really been very enriching well you know we would like to thank you uh, for being with us today for you know and we apologize to our friends for the some of the technology technological issues that were beyond our control but uh, we will have a recording of of our uh, today's event uh, in a couple of days so i'd like to thank you and your sister and sophia for helping us to be able to uh, put this together and i also would like to thank you personally for trusting me and for allowing me to put together this uh, little video that it will be so, I think, uh, and it's such an important uh, instrument for people, for Chestertonians all over the world. I also would like to thank Michael Pichotta, who's here with us, who did a great job editing and all the music and the graphics uh, was wonderful. And uh, also Sydney Hall University, because, you know, they give us a great support in order to get these things done. And of course, to everyone who has joined us today from the United States, from Poland, from uh, Norway, from different corners of the world. So thank you for being part of this Chesterton community and that Father Boy has brought together. And in uh, in a few days, as I said, I will send a notice with a link to view the recording to the presentation. We also invite you to visit our uh, new blog, Paradox with and Wonder, uh, where we will also, uh, you know, upload this information. And very soon we will announce the 2023 program. So we hope that we will also have some other other uh, event with Father Boyd now that we can kind of try to work the technology and. Um, I don't know if Dermot would like to say the last few words, but I would like to uh, thank you again. Wish you a happy Christmas and best wishes for the new year. And we hope to see you soon in 2023. Well, I have nothing to add to, to Gloria's uh, beautiful <laughs> valediction. Uh, it's been great to see Father Boyd again, uh, to have a chat with him, uh, to see him looking so well. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's just been a, a great tonic for, for, for me and for all of us. So um, this being just uh, shortly before Christmas, I wish everybody a very happy and holy Christmas and uh, please God, we will see each other uh, through the miracle of Microsoft Teams or maybe even in person uh, in the new year. So so God bless to everybody. Thank you. And a quick uh, message from Gerhard Hastes, our friend from Norway, says hello to you and that he hopes that you enjoyed his brand new bibliography, which is an excellent uh, also addition to the Chesterton world. So without any further ado, and now we will say goodbye and we wish you all the best and great to see you father Boyd. and thank you for your time and your knowledge for sharing and just for for being you thank you